from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. And now, on to the evening's event. Uh, when I'm not here in, in uh, Washington, I live in Brooklyn. And a few months ago, when I was back home, uh, I went to an event at uh, Book Court celebrating the anthology, Please Excuse This Poem, uh, 100 Poets for the Next Generation. I knew a lot about the anthology since it was edited by and featuring many of my friends and even included my wife. Uh, but after that reading and the Q&A that followed, I really grasped its groundbreaking argument that contemporary American poetry can connect to teenagers at precisely the time when so many of them learn to dislike the art. I also felt the library should continue investigating this argument, which is precisely the kind of work this institution promotes and preserves on behalf of our country. I am thrilled to welcome anthology editor Lynn Melnick, who's uh, right here, and uh, Viking senior editor Sharon November to the library. Sharon is the next person over. Um, they both came down from New York, and I'm happy that they are being joined by uh, two of our great, wonderful DC poets, Jennifer Chang right here, and Mark McMorris uh, down at the end, who are poets and professors at George Washington and Georgetown Universities, respectively. Uh, to begin, each will read uh, uh, their own poems if they're, if they're included in the anthology, and, and then a favorite uh, of theirs from somebody else. And afterwards, we'll follow up with a moderate discussion, and we'll leave some time in the end for uh, a Q&A with, with all of you. So uh, without any further ado, please join me in welcoming Jennifer Chang, Mark McMorris, Lynn Melnick, and Sharon November. Hi, can you hear me? <laughs> Thank you so much for coming, and um, I want to say thank you so much to Lynn and to Sharon who made this book possible. I hated being a teenager. Um, it was the most miserable time of my life, and I never thought that that misery could produce something so happy and positive. So it's really, um, it's great to be part of this anthology, and we can talk about that later. Um, this, I'm going to read my poem first, and a poem by um, a poet I've never heard it before, but I'm very glad to have discovered. Uh, this is called Obedience or the Lying Tale. I will do everything you tell me, mother. I will charm three gold hairs from the demon's head. I will choke the mouse that gnaws an apple tree's roots and keep its skin for a glove. To the wolf, I will be pretty and kind and curtsy his crossing of my path. The forest, vocal even in its somber tread, rages. A slope ends in a pit of foxes, drunk on rotten brambles of berries, and the raccoons ransack a rabbit's unmasked hole. What do they find but a winter's heap of droppings, a stolen nest, the cracked shell of another creature's child? I imagine this is the rabbit way, and I will not stray, mother into the forest thick, where the trees meet the dark, though I have known misgivings of light as a hot hand that flickers against my neck. The path ends at a river I must cross. I will wait for the ferryman to motion me through. Into the waves he etches with his oar a new story. A silent girl runs away. A silent girl is never safe. I will take his oar in my hand. I will learn the boat's rocking and bring myself back and forth. To be good is the hurricane of caution. I will know in decisions rowing the water I lap into my lap as he shakes his withered head. Behind me is the forest. Before me, the field, a loose run of grass. I stay in the river, mother. I study escape. This poem is by Sally Delahunt. Um, and it's, it's one of the poems I discovered here that I'm so glad um, to have discovered. And uh, 
flowers at night. It's raining in my room right now. I mean outside my room, it's raining. One time, my brother wouldn't let someone hurt me when I was little. And I liked when someone said, a poem should make you feel a feeling. I think I woman, heard a woman say that once. <coughs> my mom is dead, and to say I miss her is to have said nothing. People say I make her faces. I hope so. I hope I've made anything beautiful. Another time when I was little, someone pushed me off my bike and said my brother was a jerk. But that person didn't know about the time my brother wouldn't let someone come in my room at night. Leave her alone. She's sleeping. When that woman said a poem should make you feel a feeling, I thought about sunflowers at night, how their faces look down because the sun isn't anywhere. Maybe it's raining in my room, or maybe I mean outside my room, it's raining. Maybe I'm glad I have a brother. Thank you. Thanks to everybody who's here braving the weather, and thanks to the Library of Congress and its um, its leader uh, the, of the Poetry Center. <laughs> I'm going to read my poem. Um, it's called a poem. When the combat finally stops. Then I will come to you like a soldier to his commander, and you will decorate my chest with fingers too soft and too precious for other uses, asking my kill rate and praising my accurate eye, the night of lemon blossoms perfuming your underarms, your heart's land undressed for my touch and my guilt abolished, the blood left on the porch. The cicadas will trumpet my coming and cancel the shriek of tomahawks and soothe my ears. When the combat ceases for good, I will put off the clothes stained with shit and gunpowder, the boots eaten away and my rusty helmet, and dress up to suit your dignity. I will have cherry blossoms or the photo of a yellow pui and they will speak on my behalf of the continuous war, the war that is falling in and out of the signal's compass, the signal I rode on to this gate that creaks behind me. Combat spells the end of civility, but I must begin with you. When the combat ends and bulldozers have crushed the shanties and plowed a thousand or five corpses under the pasture, the young man has lost his legs and has questions for someone, and the vehicles head home to Greenwich, and the janitors empty the trash, and the captains hold their fire. At that time, but at no time, does the war cease from thunder and the crack of a rifle, and the book of your labyrinth has no beginning or foreseeable respite, and I must retreat as I approach. When the combat closes down, Look for me in Tempe, and you should expect some ceremony in my face, because when the war goes bankrupt and is swallowed up, then it will be time to drink a toast and to get on with it, one on one, one kiss or word at a time, in good time. And there's a date at the end, April 16, 2003. <coughs> and I'm going to read a poem by Fadi Judah called The Tea and Sage Poem. And this poem I don't think has war in it. Um, the Tea and Sage Poem. At a desk made of glass, in a glass-walled room with red airport carpet, 
an officer asked my father for fingerprints, and my father refused. So another offered him tea, and he sipped it. The teacup template for fingerprints. My father says, it was just hot water with a bag. My father says, in his country, because the earth knows the scent of history, it gave the people sage. I like my tea with sage from my mother's garden next to the snapdragons. She calls fish mouths coming out for air, a remedy for stomach pains she keeps in the kitchen where she always sings. First, she is Hagar, boiling water where tea is loosened. Then she drops in it a pinch of sage and lets it sit for a while. She tells a story. The groom arrives late to his wedding wearing only one shoe. The bride asks him about the shoe. He tells her he lost it while jumping over a house wall, breaking away from soldiers. She asks, tea with sage or tea with mint? With sage, he says, sweet scent, bitter tongue. She makes it, he drinks. a little blown that this anthology made it to the Library of Congress. Um, I just also want to um, thank Rob. And um, I just want to shout out my co-editor, Brett Fletcher Lauer, who uh, is not here, but is here in spirit. Um, I'm going to read two poems. The first is uh, by Erica Foreman, and it's called Like the Rain, Smell It Coming. I am dreaming of tornadoes again, too many for the sky to contain. I have checked eight websites in the dictionary on my nightstand. I did not need technology or a writer to tell me there is chaos in my heart. I don't tell people sometimes my dreams come true. I fear some parts are not metaphor. In the mornings I check the horizon. I am relieved when there is some whisper of light. On the way home from camping, a large storm made the highway a blur of brake lights, my fingers killers to my steering wheel. I kept searching for funnels, their willowy bodies twisting their way to the ground. Mapped out escape routes and viaducts to pull beneath. Today I fell asleep on the couch again. The wind rustled me awake, and parts of the sky were dark again. I can't shake that something is coming. I don't do well with worry. My mother built me to fix things. And um, just to change gears, um, I'm going to read a poem by Danielle Bafunda called Dear Mom and Dad. Dear Mom and Dad, I might as well ask you, why does everyone come to my window and then ask me to put on a robe or just F off? Why does everyone start a band halfway through the hand job and run out to practice? Or actually, why does everyone have some kind of car they want me to tumble into head first, slightly concussed and laughing throatily all the way to the ravine? Why do all the boys I love climb up on the trestle that runs over the ravine and slink down to its rusting out catwalks and hold on infantile, lemur-like with all four limbs while the trains, only freight trains, rumble over? Why, in the ravine, do I never find anything shinier than a beer can and never get anyone out before the cops come? I think I can die, and then, the, and then there we are up against a train, and I think, oh, it isn't that easy after all. But I might as well ask you. Coded all these years as a boy digger, coded as a kissless dog face, they get, to, they get so disappointed by my mustache. They get so angry when I make a joke. I am changing the subject. I am changing the object from comely to homely, from clumsy to a hideous drag. They ask me if they can dig out all my blackheads. They have a hundred rules about how boring I am. I say up the latest, you know. 
Out of all of them and all of you, I'm the last one with her lid laid open, a boiling beet sugar stew, pre-dawn premonition boiling over, a nosebleed. Or actually, it's just common sense. You're going to jail, and all of these boys are going to jail, and all of these girls are jailed, and all of these trains are going to jail, and if the trains even have conductors any longer, also jail, and the rest of the town is basically jail, and if you get into bed, you get into jail, and then there's mourning. It's a penitentiary for you and yours, your ugly little scab. <laughs> wow. I'm Sharon November, and um, I'm as blown as you are that this anthology has made it to the Library of Congress. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Anya. Thank you, all poets, present and not present. Thank you, Brett Lauer. I feel like I'm accepting an Oscar. Um, <laughs> I am your comic relief. Um, the two poems I've picked actually um, are both pretty funny, don't you think? Um, this first one is by Heather Crystal. It's called it's called Acorn Duly Crushed. Dear stupid forest. Dear totally brain dead forest. Dear beautiful, ugly, stupid forest full of nightingales, why won't you shut up? What do you want from me? A train is too expensive. A clerk will fall asleep. Dear bitchy, stupendous forest. Trade seats with me. Now it is your birthday. Congrats. Somebody will probably, someone will probably slap you about the face and ears. Indulgent municipal, municipal forest. Forest of scars, scarves and of beards. Dear rapid bloodless forest, you are talking all the time. You are not pithy. You are like 8,000 swans. Dear nasty pregnant forest, you are so hot. You are environmentally significant. Men love to hang themselves from your standard old growth trees. Don't look at me. You're the one with the ancient noble terror. Bad forest, forest with important gangs of leaves. Dear na naive forest, what won't you be admitting? Blunt international forest, forest of bees and of hair. You should go back to my house. We can bag drugs all night. You can tell me about your new windows, how they are just now beginning to sprout. <laughs> the second poem is called Confessions of a Teenage Drama Queen by D.A. Powell. And uh, you'll see the trick and conceit as I read, if, you, uh, if you're a movie fan. I was a male war bride. I was a spy, so I married an axe murderer. I married Joan. I married a monster from outer space. I am guilty. I am the cheese. I am a fugitive from a chain gang. Maybe I'll come home in the spring. I'll cry tomorrow. Whose life is it anyway? It's a wonderful life. I want to live. I want someone to eat cheese with. Who am I this time? I am Cuba. I am a sex addict. Why was I born? Why must I die? I could go on singing. I'll sleep when I'm dead. I know who killed me. I was 19. I was a teenage werewolf. Just kill me. Kiss me, kill me. Kill me later. Kill me again. Give me a sailor. If I had my way, I'd rather be rich. I wouldn't be in your shoes. I wish I had wings. I wish I were in Dixie. I passed for white. I was framed. I was a burlesque queen. I was a teenage zombie. I was an adventuress. I was a convict. I was a criminal. I did it. I killed that man. Murder is my beat. I confess. <laughs> this is for David Trinidad. <laughs> Thanks to all of you for terrific readings, uh, and I think readings that showcase the variety of tones um, and approaches to, uh, to poetry that um, these writers were capable of pulling off. Um, there are a lot of places I could start in this conversation, but I think I want to start with Lynn, just because she's the editor of the anthology. Um, Lynn, uh, you should make sure it's turned on. You have to press the button, it will glow green. <laughs> uh, it is on, and now I'm going to ask you a big question. Um, in the editor's notes, you wrote, quote, poetry can change perceptions, sympathies, lives, end quote, and that you and fellow editor Brett Fletcher Lauer were, quote, both troubled teenagers who felt, in some part, saved by poetry, end quote. Can you talk about the, how the poems in this anthology might do that work? Uh, I can try. Uh, I, oh, I do. I do really very much believe that poetry can 
can do all those things, change, um, change lives. Uh, poetry just has a way of, um, of opening up the world to us that maybe we didn't see before. And I think, um, especially for someone who's a young person, it can uh, hit at the right time and, and suddenly the world makes more sense. I certainly had that experience. Um, I remember reading one of the uh, first books, um, and, and I, I was a troubled teenager. I had dropped out of school, and I remember finding a, um, the book, Dancing on the Grave of a Son of a Bitch. Can you say bitch? Um, <laughs> it's a book of poetry. It's a book of poetry by, by Dan Rakowski. And, um, and finding that poem in that, but the title poem in that book completely changed my life because I felt like I was it was me talking. It, it made sense to me, and it spoke to me in a way that, um, that uh, felt like I was speaking to myself. And so I do believe, and that was part of the thought behind the book, um, because another book that I remember finding at Goodwill was uh, an anthology that was edited for adults, which you know most poetry anthologies are. It was a Daniel Halpern, I forget exactly what it's called, but it's like American Poetry Anthology. It came out in the 80s. Um, and I, I loved it, but probably 70% I didn't understand because I was, you know, like 15, 16 years old. So <laughs> it was a little bit over my head and out of my experience. Yeah. So w what I wanted to do here, I don't know if I'm answering your question, but what I wanted to do here was edit a, po a, 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 a anthology, and Brett did as well, that just had young people in mind that had, so every poem would speak to them in some way. It's interesting you bring up that anthology that you ran across when you were younger because uh, these poems weren't written, I'm assuming, for teenagers in mind. They're poems that you found by, by yes. contemporary American poets um, yes. written, for, written for presumably an adult audience. Yes. And uh, I want to just talk, maybe this is a way to pivot to you, Sharon, and talk about uh, getting this book and thinking about how you might market it, and especially in relation to the YA fiction phenomenon. There is this whole category that's, you know, a hot category in publishing, YA, YA publishing, and here's a book that's, that's taking in poems by adults, quote, uh, for adults, supposedly, that, um, that um, you are gearing towards that same kind of audience. The easiest way to do this is to think of yourself at 16. No, this is, this, is how you, this is how you publish for children. You think of yourself at all those ages. And I think a lot of, I think the pivot age is like 15, 16, really 16, because that was when it was for me too as a reader. Um, when this anthology proposal came to me, I just, I couldn't believe it. Because it's perfect for the pretentious 16 year old writing poetry. <laughs> Yes, everybody was. Um, I was, well, I was, and I would not have read anything that had teenage anywhere. I did not want it to look like anything to do with teenagers. Um, we can talk about the cover at some point, which would be fun to do. But what was important about this book when I saw it was this is an aspirational book. Everybody in this book is young. They are all actively writing. They're still building their careers. There's a really wonderful range. There's Twitter poets. There's people who have been in, in Poetry Magazine. There are people who are teaching at colleges. There are people who are not. There's this, and it's just very diverse. And we can talk about what we went through, and I think it's an interesting thing about the process of that. But mostly you think about the teenager who you were. Would you have picked up this book? Mm -hmm. Would this book have galvanized you? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Because these are people you can be. <laughs> and the range of poetry is so phenomenal. There is something for everybody here. Mm -hmm. It's just such an exciting project, and not a project that you see coming out of children's or YA at all. Best part? Adults look at this and say, wow, $16.99, what a deal. I'll take it. <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about why this, this sort of thing isn't coming out of YA or children's at all? What's happening differently with this anthology that might speak to how we could promote poetry more mm. effectively? Well, should I blow my own horn? Yeah. Please do. Yeah. Fine. <laughs> um, I, think in, I think in this case, it was a combination of 
the right agent, the right editor, and the right book at the right time. Because there really is nothing else like this out there, nothing. If you see it, it's coming out of the adult side, but it's much more expensive, and it doesn't feel as fresh. It doesn't look as interesting. I mean, at least if I were a teenager, I, w I, w I would pick up whatever anthologies were around. But this is, we took real pains not to say anything about, you're a teenager, hey teenagers. And the original title <laughs> of this book, <laughs> shall we talk about that? Sure. The original title of this book, which you know is still my sentimental favorite, um, she loved it. Can you tell? Um, was uh, one hundred poems your teachers don't want you to read. You right? You remember that? That's great. great. Um, it's popular with. I like it. Yeah, it's popular with adults. Are there any teenagers out there? No. Hi, teenagers. Which 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 title do you like better? <laughs> that, was, that is a serious thumbs up. This, <laughs> this, this person is a diplomat. <laughs> but, she knows me too, so she's probably careful. But I thought when you say 100 poems your teacher doesn't want you to read, my, I'm thinking, you know, you're eight, you're nine. It's all about picking your nose at recess or something. It just, you know, it, it, it doesn't sound, it doesn't have the the seriousness, the gravity, mm -hmm. the, mm -hmm. and so they came up with all these great titles, and this is the one that we like the best, and I think it really works, because it's got the school part to it, but it also just, I just think it's, it's a terrific title. I think there aren't more books like this, because people don't necessarily know what to do with the proposals when they get them. They don't know if the book will sell, they don't know how to promote it, they don't know who to talk to. Um, I could be wrong. I'm always happy to be proven wrong, but when this came in, I brought it to an editorial meeting, and my colleagues were like, this sounds great. And I was like, terrific, great, I'll buy it. And it became this great labor of love, and everybody who was involved in it was just, I mean, everybody in-house, everybody wanted this book to get to the readers. Mm -hmm. And happily, we know lots of English teachers <laughs> and academic marketing across the street who deals with colleges and booksellers. And this is the book that can be cross-shelved. Because if you're a pretentious teenager, you are not in the children's section or the YA poetry section. You are in the adult poetry section. And that's why this book needs to be there. So, I mean, I could talk all day about this because I've, talk I've, I've talked about this book a lot. <laughs> and I just love it so much. It's pretty spectacular. I think so, too. I think so, too. Um, I just wanted to broaden it to talk to uh, the two of you, Mark and Jen. Uh, you both teach college students, uh, presumably the kinds of kids who are buying this book a year or two before they show up in your classes as freshmen. And um, do you think that this, this, these poems might speak to them in some, in some unique way? I'm really trying to get at what's happening in these poems specifically that, um, that a teenage audience could sort of uh, respond to. Go ahead. I can talk. <laughs> let me let me let me try to get well, let me try to get Jen and Mark in first, and then we'll we'll circle around. Um, I will say that there's something that happens between high school and college. That I don't know what exactly it is, but when they get to college and they get into the poetry workshop or the creative writing class, they don't know how to play anymore, and they're they're obsessed with getting it right and playing by the rules. And then you show them poems, and it, I've taught some of the poems in this book before, really? and they realize that they realize that there's another way to perceive the world, another way to express language that doesn't have to be literal or abide by rules, or even comfortable or safe, or even make sense. And I think that teenage what what, what this speaks to too, and what why teenagers <coughs> like poetry is that. At a certain point, you're 14, and you realize everything's a sham, <laughs> and that and that the literal truth of the world is is um, not right. It's, it's BS. <laughs> um, and I think what's great about poetry is that it doesn't it doesn't follow literal language, and that the figurative language makes a place that's elsewhere from from the ugly, mundane, rule bound world that even now we're stuck in. And, and like with with my students. Um, I mean, one of my colleagues I co-teach with him right now, it's amazing how they just don't want to make a mistake or play play. Mm -hmm. um, and play is actually a, a, a 
profoundly intellectual enterprise that poems, I think, real, reveal to us as writers and readers. Um, just um, <coughs> listening to the readings um, this evening, um, I'm struck once again at um, the, the lively voices um, collected here. And, um, um, you know, they, they're, they're voices with attitude. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, they can perhaps provide somebody who's searching for, um, you know, ways in, in, in which to sort of represent one, you know, him or herself to the world. You know, this, this collection has um, um, quite a few options. You know, there's a sort of a menu of attitudes <laughs> that you can sample, you know. So that's one way to think about it. Um, you know, not to say that the poems are only concerned with masking or only concerned, um, uh, you know, with poses. Um, but I think that the strength of the collection is in the is in the um, the multiplicity of of the voices um, uh, that one hears and that 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 are that are quite engaging. Um, you know, all credit. Um, yes. You know, to the to the editors um, for your selection um, because these are uh, poems that um, were already in print. Yes. If I because I know that mine was already in yes, print. Yes, they're all already. And well, you you, you 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 read a lot. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and then and then and then to select this a uh, hundred poems that sort of work together but but have their you know their own qualities. I mean, I think it's just a. Um, a terrific introduction to uh, uh, the range and variety of contemporary voices. Yes. Um, and, and they're not all, of course, they're not all poems in the voices of, uh, of younger people. You know, they're older you know, voices as well. Okay. You know, so that, that's one of the things I would single out, Rob, um, you know, is the, the modeling of attitudes, you know, that you could find in yeah. here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, Lynn and Sharon, could you talk a little bit about the selection process? Oh, yeah. How you how you narrowed it down to a hundred poems and how you balanced things out? This is this is more you, really. I mean, I I trusted you guys completely. Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, I think when we brought the original, the first draft of the final manuscript, I think we probably swapped out about maybe ten poems. Yes. Yeah. Um, I remember sitting there in your office. She's looking through all the, the poems. Like, oh no, yeah, I like this one. Oh, I love this one. And this one's got to go. And <laughs> I remember that very clearly. Oh God. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. It's, a, it's an important moment. Um, the process of how we you want to know more about how we should, well, it's sort of uh, maybe it's a little bit mystical. I don't know how it all came together. Um, one thing is that Brett and I have uh, Brett and I, my co-editor, have been friends for probably 15 or so years, and so we know each other very well, but we have very different aesthetics for, for what we prefer, for the most part. So that was actually very helpful, because if I were to make a poem of 100 poems for teenagers, they'd be all these like really like mopey, just affected yeah. girl poems. <laughs> and, and his would be sort of mopey, uh, you know, moody, sarcastic boy poems. And so it was kind of... <laughs> It was a rather good um, collaboration, I think. Um, and it, it was also very important to, to both of us that we had poems for every kid who would open the anthology, so that there was something, so someone could see themselves, um, no matter you know what their background, uh, you know what their you know of any kind, they could they could open this and they could see poems by not just. Um, poems about you know, issues of all kinds, but also poets, to see poets as actual living, functioning human beings who aren't like, you know, dead of consumption somewhere in the 19th century. And that these, and that these poets um, were all kinds of people. Yes. And, um, and so we made sure that was one of the things that we uh, were very committed to, and Sharon is as well, um, and so to make sure that of these hundred people that it actually looked like the population that would be reading the anthology. And that was, yeah. and so there was, it wasn't, um, you know, I in general tend to read pretty widely and I would imagine Brett does too. And so 
it, it, that, that wasn't difficult to find, but we definitely had a mind to that in editing because it's, it, it, that was most important. It was fascinating, I have to say, just because the things that are not in this book mm -hmm. that people would expect would be teenage poets. Mm -hmm. No, mm -hmm. no, 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 no. Um, because you don't, this is for them, this is not of them. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think you need to take people seriously. And I, as a teenager, if you see a teenage poet, it's like, oh, there's that token teenage poet, you know? Um, song lyrics. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which some people may argue are poetry, that's a totally other panel mm -hmm. for the Library of Congress. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but what I loved was, even in the proposal, the incredible range and their, and their just complete dedication to making sure there was something for everybody. So it's a 50-50 split male-female. I think we had, I think I it's 51-41 women. <laughs> that sounds just like the population. <laughs> that works for me. It's all about the numbers. Not that I'm keeping track. <laughs> yeah, right? Um, but, you know, multiracial. Mm -hmm. um, multi, you know, just like gay, straight, trans, mm -hmm. bi, mm -hmm. immigrants. All, like, this basically is a book that looks like America. Mm -hmm. And that's, to me, incredibly cool. But the other part, let's talk about forms. Yes. Because I asked for poems, with, I said there are no poems that have forms here. I think that that is something that, because so, uh, the greatest way to learn is to just write every single form. Yeah, and we, uh, the, uh, we, have, we have a Sistina, we have a Villanelle, and we have a Sonnet. You have a Sonnet. Um, which is all very exciting because they're all very contemporary. Exactly. And um, so it's not, you know, it's not your great, great, great grandfather's sonnet. <laughs> no, no, this is a living sonnet. Exactly. I mean, this, this, this is a living document. And that's what's so cool about it. It, it will be relevant in five years. Oh, it totally will. See, this is something an editor does. She's great. It will be relevant. It will be relevant. It will be relevant. Uh, I want to just go, go my question in a different way, though, uh, and maybe address it to all of you. Uh, in some ways, taking on a project like this with an anthology begs the question, what is an adult poem versus a poem for teenagers? Um, a poem for teenagers is a poem that teenagers read. But what is a poem that a teenager won't read? You had to make that determination, obviously. A poem about being middle-aged. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Men at 40, yeah. for instance. A poem about having a baby. Yeah. I mean, your second baby when your husband is 45 or something. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like. So poems that situate themselves yeah. at a different point in time very clearly uh, and, and in the speaker's life. Oh, I don't know. I mean, the, um, I, I would think, I would like to think of it as more in terms of the experiences that you've gone through. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so that, you know, if you, you know, depending on what you're, you've experienced in your own life, I think that that can, um, um, you know, you know, that that can that can have prepared your your mind um, and your emotions and um, just your your awareness uh, to um, to engage with certain poems. Mm -hmm. You know, where somebody who maybe hasn't exper experienced um, those things um, might find certain elements of a, of a poem opaque. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, not that they wouldn't be able to read the vocabulary or even understand what was being said, but to feel yeah. it, to, to, mm -hmm. to really get it, mm -hmm. I think. It's like, it's like our, you know, I used to, we used to talk about, um, uh, with my friends when we were younger, we used to talk about the fact that um, so and so oh, they haven't had their heart broken yet. They're not going to write good poetry for, until they've had their heart broken. <laughs> 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 Something like that, you know. The thing, and I want you to talk. I will. <laughs> um, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm moderating away from you. Um, no worries. My apologies. Um, it makes me think of young adult literature. And these books are about intensity. This, these poems are all very intense in their various ways. And in many ways, even if people are looking back, they're looking back at the things that they've experienced for the first time. Or when you read this, you, can, you could see yourself doing some of these things. 
And so there's this sense of accessibility, but also a sense of intensity. When we, when we were talking about poetry before, I think of it as sort of a mind without a body, just like being intense and sparking everywhere. Mm -hmm. And that's what it is. The sense of humor is hugely important because when you write poems as a teenager, you're often just like, the world is terrible, I hate everything, I'm so emo. <laughs> and it's harder to be funny. Mm -hmm. And some of these poems are so funny. Mm -hmm. I'm done, here, take this away. Well, I, I think some of the poems are also very sad. And um, the reason I chose the Sally Delahat poem was she keeps saying, um, poem makes you feel a feeling. Mm. And it doesn't have to be articulatable. No. Mm. no. And um, there's also a lot of language play. And, yes. Um, the poem that you read, Sharon, um, the D.A. Powell poem about Confessions of a Teenage Drama Queen, that's such a hilarious poem, but it's also a collage of movie titles. And you read that, and there's a sort of surprise in the reader where you're, you're in cahoots with a writer, and there's that kind of invitation that a poem enables. Yeah. And that, to me, isn't just a, it, that's a teenage poem, because suddenly oh, yeah. you're, you, have, you, you get invited into something that's, again, yeah. not, that feels like something. You get to feel things, <laughs> and it's OK to feel things. Yeah. The book gives you permission mm -hmm. to like any kind of poetry you want. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's what this book does. Well, and my final question before we open it up to Q&A with the audience is um, the sort of big question, how do we take the great um, success of this book as a model for how uh, institutions like the Library of Congress or organizations can uh, more effectively uh, reach out to teenage audiences and show them the great value of, um, of contemporary American poets? Let us say dirty words. <laughs> <laughs> not, not in this video. Uh, <laughs> so, so I think um, teenagers. I don't know if you could really even say this. I don't know if I could say this. Um, um, but um, there, there are teenagers. People of a certain age, and um, they love to be able to write. Right, they're, they're, there's always going to be teenagers who are writing in their journal, for example. Um, there are going to be teenagers who have things to say um, that they keep bottled up, um, that, they're, that they're brooding over. So then the question is, um, can this book um, put in front of them with a writing teacher, um, kind, of, kind of show them how they can use language as well, they can model their own writing on something that they find in here. Maybe they could pick a poem for themselves, or one could be, a couple could be chosen. Um, but the way to get them to read is to invite them to write, is one thought. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, giving them, teaching them some devices, teaching them metaphor, teaching them about the image, teaching them about just even the active verb, just the stanza form, mm -hmm. what the line break is teaching them about maybe a little narrative, mm -hmm. uh, maybe a little bit of, you know, and giving them enough of a kind of a toolkit that they mm -hmm. can feel that they're doing something that um, um, is real because this is what real poets use too, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You know, something like that. And this is real poetry. We should talk about the back matter briefly, shouldn't we? Yeah, we can talk. That actually kind of, um, plays into what I have is going to answer the question a little bit. Um, I've taught teenagers uh, poetry, and one thing I think I've realized is that how they are taught poetry in school is, is, is bad. <laughs> in, in high schools, it seems to me that high school teachers are, can be a little bit afraid of teaching poetry. I think that um, um, they always think there's some hidden meaning. I remember in college, um, reading, um, I believe it was the, the Wasteland, and the word restaurant was in there, and we spent like half an hour with the teacher telling us that it, it, what it really meant was rest or rant, and that's how you read the whole poem, and I'm like, what the F are you talking about? And I was like, I'm never gonna get poetry, like clearly, I'm just, I don't get it. Um, and I think that, so teachers feel that way, and then they pass that on to students, and, but the crazy thing, is that teenagers are probably more likely to write poetry than any other age group, mm -hmm. right? Like they just, they don't think that they're writing, uh, they, I don't know how they, it, there's a disconnect between the amount of poetry they're writing and the amount of contemporary poetry they're reading mm -hmm. because what they're being taught in school 
is, I mean, I, when I, I taught down at Coney Island uh, at public housing, and they had only ever learned Edgar Allan Poe, and so I brought in Nikki <laughs> Giovanni, and like it blew their minds. They were like, "Whoa!" Um, and it was like poetry that made sense to them and that spoke to them. So this is, yeah. so the idea that um, poetry is for now and written by um, people, real, uh, people. real people, and so that was part of the idea of the book. And in the back matter, we asked twenty about about twenty questions. Uh, of different sorts, from what was the first poem you read and loved to what's your favorite food and like what's your least favorite word, um, to get to know the poets as people and and like the poets are actually living right now and they're writing right now and they're not um, you know these these sort of long dead people that you're forced to read in school and told you don't understand um, and there, we also have the poets um, Twitter handles and stuff I've had a few get in touch with me and it's and they're Great. Some of the teenagers are great, you know, with their questions, and um, and I think that's maybe what we a way to reach young people is to convince them that their writing of poetry is not divorced from yep. contemporary poetry that's happening right now because they tend to give it up, I guess, at some point. Well, it's funny because it I I think when you were talking about the lack of play, that's also what happens with poetry. People stop writing it. I think because they feel that I'm I, I, I can't they find their vocation or they give it up because it's like well that's not serious I got to do something serious now so I think the playing is hugely important and you're absolutely right about that this is a book about breaking rules and they they did an amazing job with social media and so there is a Tumblr please excuse this poem and you can go to it and there's all these quotes and there's interviews and all sorts of really great stuff and I mean they just took the ball and ran with it really but we also had a lot of meetings we strategized how to reach out and this is a book that I, I keep talking about and will keep talking about um, because it, in some ways it should never be a backless book. Mm. I always want it to be a frontless book, and okay. I want to get it adopted in classrooms. Why are, what? Because she's I just said, so I said, happy. I said, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Is that a thing? She likes it. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, let me borrow one of your mics, and we're going to open up to questions. So if you just could wait for the mic to come to you so Sorry. we can record you. No, Anybody have a question out there oh, in the world? <laughs> Our big, wonderful, great audience. There's got to be a question. Okay. Sandra Beasley, take it the first question. So it seems like, in some ways, um, this is strongly relatable and it does have, it will always feel um, current, and I love the idea of it staying in front of the list. But it also, in some ways, captures a moment of contemporary poetry. And so my question would be, if this book were to be updated 10 or 15 years from now, where do you think it might be different? And if that feels ab too abstract, how are the ways in which this book is, this particular version is different from if you say had been editors in 2000, mm -hmm. 2001? Because I, I realize sometimes forecasting is tricky, but I can already kind of articulate or identify certain trends in the language mm. that reflect growth just for the last 10 years. So I'm really curious about that. This is, this is you. And do we have all the mics? Oh, right, it's out there. This is me, you? Yeah, no, no it's maybe. not me. Oh, it's, I don't know. Oh, it's I don't, me? I can't forecast I have to, I have well, to forecast. You're, you're the okay. editor. Um, well, I can the say that I already, <laughs> I have a file, you know, just so Sherry knows, if, you know, for book two, um, of poets I'm collecting that I, I wish I had put in. You know, it was so hard, and, and I find, you know, I'm constantly discovering new poets, and so um, it's, you know, oh, this person would have been great in the book. So there's that. I mean, there's, there's just always going to be new poets and new poetry styles. Um, I'm hoping, I think anything you edit is going to be of the moment. Um, and I was thinking about that uh, Dan Halpern anthology. I mean, it's, it's so 80s. It's got like, it's such an 80s. Um, a stone yeah. poem. Yeah, <laughs> you know, it's just like super 80s. Um, and yeah, I should have shoulder pads yeah. on. Um, yeah. but, so this one is going to seem very, like you said, of, of the moment now. And, and one thing I think I'm glad for that we're publishing it now, and like not in 2000, is that there is. Um, 
there, well, there's social media, and there's also, um, uh, because there's more small presses, there is more diversity of voices. If we had done this in 2000, there would have been, I think, fewer people to choose from, or at least uh, it's easily to locate to choose from. So, so that's kind of, yeah, that was kind of exciting. Um, I don't know if I would update it. I think that, I, I mean, this is, I don't know, maybe this sounds overconfident, but I feel um, that all of these poems will speak to teenagers. Um, no matter when we are, where we are in time, um, we had, there's a poem, and Rob and I were talking about this poem earlier. There's a poem called "Ricky Martin on Homosexuality" by Julian Berlaski. Um, I'm fairly certain that like most teenagers don't really know who the hell Ricky Martin is. Um, one thing I discovered editing this is that I'm really really old, <laughs> um, and but the poem speaks, so they might not know all the references, you know, and. Um, but they will understand what the poem is saying, I hope. And um, and if I ever have a chance to do number two, I've got that file. Cool. <laughs> I don't I, know if that answers your question. I had no idea. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> Another question out there? Really? It's just such a quiet audience. You know, one one other one other Comparison I wanted to make is to the, the great successes of um, Jackman Woodson and uh, Kwame Alexander, books that are written as poems that are sort of more narrative. And I imagine that this does a different kind of work by arguing for, by arguing for sort of individual poems, by arguing for that kind of concision, by something that's arguing for something that is um, a little, that's more conventional in a way. Although you do include uh, the big long poem, The Rape Joke, in this, in this anthology. A very, a very um, probably the most well known, well known poem. Yeah, yeah. Well -known. Oh, one of the most well known poems of the last few years, in yeah. fact. It's like the only poem that ever went viral. I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, but maybe you could talk about that, especially you, Sharon, because you know the sort of impact of those books. Um, that 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 won. I think they won the Caldecott and the National Book Award, uh, respectively. Ah, uh, Newbery. Newbery, sorry. And Caldecott is for picture books. Sorry. And a picture book is as hard to write as a poem. See, um, a book written, a novel written in verse and a book of poetry are two entirely different things. Um, and we see a lot, there are a lot of books written in verse. And in many cases, you're like, this could have been prose. You're just randomly breaking some lines. <laughs> um, it's true, but you can really tell, like Kwame Alexander or Jackie Woodson or Virginia Ewer Wolf's Make Lemonade, which I always love to mention because it's so spectacular, and there are so many others, but I think that that form makes a book perhaps less threatening to certain people, but it's also in a lot of ways harder. Anything in the poetic form is harder, be it a picture book, which is every word counts in a picture book, be it a novel in verse, which has to be intentional. It has to be, in my mind, a novel in verse can be nothing, it can't be a prose book. It has to, that story has to be told that way. This is a totally different animal to me, but I love that you have poetry in all the different areas. There's nonfiction for middle graders or YA that, that feels very poetic to me. There's books like this, which are anthologies of a wide range of people. There's novels that are just written in poems, that add just poem after poem, or one long poem. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that the word, it is, it's something that has been going on for years, the novels written as poems. Mm -hmm. Jackie Woodson's Locomotion came out quite some time ago, mm -hmm. but, and Make Lemonade as well, and True Believer, mm -hmm. and those books are really canon in my world. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're spectacular. A book like this is a little less conventional. Mm -hmm. You'll see, again, you'll see this in the adult section more. But I think it's a wonderful way to map children's and young adult literature mm -hmm. as poetry. Where is the poetry here? Mm -hmm. Who calls out to it? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. okay. A question over here. Yeah, um, I think 
probably just say this. <laughs> yeah. so, so I have a question for the pedagogues um, who think a lot about teaching, and, and also kind of an editorial question, which is just that, you know, did you have to do a lot of progressive thinking about what teenage life is? I, I know you had mentioned this kind of five-year time horizon that you're thinking, you know, you want five years this to be a progress book. Mm -hmm. Like, did you have to think? Because, because my experience with students is, is sometimes a kind of like, oh my god, the things they're trying to write totally exceed my imagination in, in certain ways. Mm -hmm. And so I wondered if you kind of were trying to think, I mean, you said, I'm old. <laughs> did you try to think a lot about sort of <laughs> comparative teenagehood? Does that make sense? Yeah. Like, because I, th I think these kids are living in a totally different media environment, a formal environment. Everything feels, you know, sometimes even when I go into the classroom, it feels like a little, I, I don't know what their experience is totally. Um, so I'm just interested from an editorial perspective. Well, I'll answer from, the, and they, they can answer from a, yeah. a professor perspective. Um, I, um, I haven't taught college students. I do teach high school students, and um, so, which is why I feel old. Um, I think one of the things that I've learned from teaching high school students is that um, they are um, sort of hungry for this to, to be heard, I think, more than anything. And so when they read something that makes them feel heard or that mm -hmm. makes them, it, it is like mind blowing. I mean, I've, I've, um, I've taught, um, classes in public housing where really I just they just wanted me to listen to them read their own poems because they wanted they just wanted to be heard they didn't I, I had come in there with like all these plans and like workshop ideas and I was like, they just want me to hear them um, so and, and I think that for for teaching high school students I think that's like a big part of it they just but for teaching when you teach actual poems I think um, that what they are obviously their frame of reference is very different from ours and like you know when you have to like explain to them what you know yeah, like that phones used to have cords and things like that <laughs> i mean those are very obvious things that we now you know like that are just lost um but i think the the basic emotions and feelings tend to be the same once the, and and the things that they respond to mm -hmm. tend to be similar to the things that I might have responded to. I, I, I actually think that um, when I've taught teenagers, they seem a little more together than I was. <laughs> like they seem more ambitious and, and just not so effed up, as we say on this video. Um, so I, I, I think, I guess to answer your question, um, they want what, what we, I, Teenagers want what we want. They just, their frame of reference, as we were saying earlier, exactly. is just a little more narrow. And their lives are more complicated in some ways because they don't know what, uh, what's going on, but also, you know, less complicated. And so they have more time to think about the stuff that we wish we had done. So I don't know if that answers your question. I'm going to hand this to a professor. <laughs> <laughs> No, I, I, I wouldn't know what to choose for a teenager, but I, I do think that um, I feel like this this might be just me preaching to myself or to the choir or whatever. Um, but I feel like it's so hard to be a person now, and it's especially hard to be a teenager. Yeah. And the fact that they're, they're, they seem so together really worries me because they should be messed up. It's <laughs> such a, and I, it's not, I don't think it's funny. I think it's really, I, I feel like now more than ever, Teenagers, kids need poetry. They need a place yes. to be alone with themselves yes. and to make sense of these feelings. That I mean, I the fact that we were able to be effed up as teenagers and act out and you know fail out of class or cut class and yes. smoke cigarettes in the woods <laughs> is is something that seems so much more foreign to like my my nephew yes. has just turned fourteen yes. and he could not imagine that because he's thinking about Harvard and I. I, I just want him to mess up, and I want him to, I want him to be okay with being a mess and feeling bad. And I mean, even for my college students, I think I, I hope um, that the poems will somehow free themselves to be more themselves because they seem really lost, and I worry about them. And I, I had problems with 
students who I had to file reports for them because they, there's something really wrong. Have you read Excellent Sheep? I, I know of the book. It's great. The, the, the William Dezerowitz book. Um, it's and he's written about how there's no more solitude. Exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I, everything that you're saying goes back to the fact that people are very trapped mm -hmm. very early. And so you can't screw up. Stakes are so much higher. There's no room to fail. And that makes me so angry because you you have to fail. You know, it's like fail, fail better. Yeah. But you have to fail so you can keep go so you can learn what failure is, and then you can succeed. You can fail less badly. You can, but because that's what writing is. I'm giving this to the other professor. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm not. Um, I'm not sure I'm able to connect the, the question to um, the, the question was how do I how do I teach teenagers? <laughs> the most general form of the question, yeah. I mean, I think it's because just just given that they live in a sort of different, uh, I think they really do live in a different media world. That's my experience with teaching, and I try to kind of uh, leave that space. So I was just wondering, in terms of teaching teenagers or trying to reach teenagers. Um, what, find what I find is that the um, students who who end up in my writing classes don't actually read anything. Um, <laughs> it's like a book is a foreign object to them. They last read a book in sophomore year in high school. Um, my experience is different. What can say? The um, and I so I'll I'll take a survey. I'll say, um, oh, you're here to. This is great. It's good to see you all. We're gonna have such a great time. We're gonna do poetry. Poetry is the, it's like it's a, um, it's a great privilege to be able to write poetry, and I'm gonna help guide you in this. So, um, what poetry? What poets have you read recently yes. that you really are keen on? Um, and um, um, the 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 responses are, I guess I guess they're no longer surprising. <laughs> they used to be surprising. Um, but very few of those kids, and some of them turn out to be terrific writers, um, uh, you know, that I, that I think of as you know, people who, if they wanted to, you know, given sort of their, their menu of life choices, could, could keep writing if they wanted to. Um, you know, they'll say something like, I, uh, E. E. Cummings, Shel Silverstein. Miss it, Shel <laughs> I, I had to go look up Shel Silverstein <laughs> to figure out who this guy is. I, I thought, like, this is the Milton of the sophomore year or something. You know, it's like. <laughs> Shel Silverstein is pretty great, I gotta say. <laughs> Billy Collins was another favorite, yeah. you know, who is held in high regard in these precincts, mm -hmm. yes. Um, but, what, but, but, but my point is that, that they had read very little recently. Um, they weren't readers. They didn't see themselves as readers. The, these um, books of poetry, poems, didn't have the, whatever was in those books. They, it wasn't. It wasn't help. It wasn't giving them right. whatever they were looking for. Mm -hmm. um, and um, you know, so so I had to decide. I guess what what sort of attitude to take towards this. You know, the fact that like I have had a, a room full of writers or would be writers. Who didn't want to read <laughs> and who hadn't been reading, you know? And um, it wasn't a qu you know I you know I could I didn't I didn't take the, the, the sort of like the moral position of um, you know well your teachers ought to have been able to sort of introduce you to reading so that you would love reading you know that's just you know pointless. Um, <laughs> um, but but it, but yeah so so there so right there there's a there's a, a disconnect right <laughs> between you and and the students mm -hmm. right. Um, it's not that they don't read, it's that the thing that they wanted to learn how to write, they didn't, sort of, they weren't moved to go and seek it out to read it. And I, I don't know what, you know, if that's so, I, I've talked long enough on that. I mean, I, 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 um, I can actually speak my, to that. My writing classes, just to say one last thing, my writing classes always have, they have to read a book a week. Um, and, um, you know, and some of these books are very challenging. You know, there's a range, and um, and I've, I've I have found that, um, that 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 by and large the students really take to it, but it's an alien thing for them when they begin. 
I'll tell a very brief story, um, which has nothing to do with teenagers or poetry, <laughs> but will illuminate. Um, I was talking to a group of people who wanted to write books for children. And I asked them, so who have you read? Crickets. Um, I think people, you have to do anything well, like novels, poetry, you have to read. So much of it is osmosis. You read enough and you just learn how language works. I know a lot of, there have actually been a lot of studies just coming up lately, teenagers don't, teenagers prefer to read books. They don't use the e-reader or read on their phones as much because you're looking at a computer all day for school. Mm -hmm. This is a special, this is where you go to be by yourself. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I agree with what you said. Teenagers are exactly the same. You know, somebody you'll teach is going to have some of the same problems that your grandparents had. Will this person like me? Will I have friends? Where do I fit? What will I do? It's just the way it's expressed is different, but you can still touch into the, those emotions are constant and don't change. So there are absolutely ways to reach them even if they're, they don't know that a phone had a cord or they don't know what a VHS player is or you know, the fact that 30 years ago or 40 years ago, nobody had an answering machine. But it doesn't, but the emotions are still constant. One thing, um, and this is a little bit off topic, but I, I think um, when we're talking about uh, these teenagers, we have <coughs> a certain kind of teenager in mind, and I, and I realize yeah. that's where your, your, your yeah. question is coming from your own teaching. Um, but. And I, and I have taught those teenagers and, and they don't read because I think partly they don't realize that poetry is being written now. Um, because we, I did a survey with them to ask uh, who they were being taught in school and they were being taught in school the usual um, dead white men and then also Toni Morrison. Um, that's like pretty much the syllabus in the New York City public schools. Um, so I, you know, but, and, and teenagers do seem over-programmed and over-scheduled um, and, and all this. There is a certain segment of the population, which is not small, which um, are completely disadvantaged and, um, and don't have books even. Um, and so one of the, the things that has been the biggest joy to me about this, uh, publishing this, is that it has gotten into a lot of libraries. And I was saying to Mark earlier, I have this weird obsession where I go onto library websites and see where the book's being checked out. And it has been checked out, and I only know LA and New York, like the different areas. It gets checked out in the underprivileged areas pretty much constantly. And and that to me, that's a different kind of teen, but that like, you know, I'm not gonna cry, but this is, that's what I wanted for this book was that anybody could read, any teenager could read poetry and yes. find it. And so that's, you know, I just wanna shout out those, those guys too. Well, and if all of you could help us out and get a copy of Please Excuse This Poem, it's being sold out there. You can get it signed by, by two of the authors, yes. uh, two editors, uh, and I'd like to thank all four of them for an amazing conversation. Thanks for coming thank out. Thank you. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.